Okay, good morning and welcome to our online viewers watching the online service. We're still in this time called Epiphany in the church and we've, we've struggled with the idea of what it means for a while. Epiphany refers to that time in the church directly after Christmas when we specifically remember and celebrate Jesus revealing himself, his identity as the Son of God, as the King of Kings in this time. And a funny thing happens, in a few weeks, we move from this time of revelation into the time of Lent, where we walk with Jesus on his journey of suffering towards his cross, and, and something of epiphany becomes clear to us in Jesus' suffering that we are only now beginning to understand in the readings and the, and the movements we have during this time in the church season. Last week... We had the Gospel of John, and we had the story in which Philip went to his friend Nathaniel and said to him, if you want to know what the Messiah is like, come and see. And the message that we, that we discussed, that we explored, is specifically the invitation of those words, come and see, for the Christian life, for the life of faith, for a life that is built not on arguments and on hypotheticals, but on the blood and the sweat and the tears of a lived existence. Today we have the Gospel of Mark, a different story, a well-known story, and one that has just as big implications for this life of faith, for this life lived under the providence of God. So, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20, and we'll make a few references to the earlier chapters of, uh, earlier verses of Mark chapter 1 as well. After John, John the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. For they were fishermen. Come, follow me, said Jesus, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Six verses. This is the word of the Lord, the gospel of the Lord for us today. The, 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 the wonderful thing about preaching the gospel, and I think about preaching the gospel in the time of Epiphany, is specifically that we let the story do the talking and do the teaching and do the preaching in that sense. We know this story so well. We know some of, the, some of the phrases coined by Mark here so well. Kingdom of God, believe the good news, repentance, even the, the wonderfully imaginative image of being fishers of men is so well known to us that we just tell the story and let the images take us into what God intends for it today. So let's explore the story. Let's uh, pay some attention to what it all means when we put it together. The first thing we need to say is, as the other gospel writers, Mark starts his gospel with the words, the gospel of Jesus Christ, brackets, as told by Mark. Now that word gospel comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word which meant good story. But it's based on an older Latin word, which is based on an older Greek word that we find here in this chapter, twice in our reading today, the good news. Now in Greek, this phrase, good news, is called an eongelion. And it is a phrase, it is a, it is a type of message, a form of literature that the Romans used to announce military conquests or to announce that uh, Caesar or some important ruler was arriving in a, in a region, or in a city, or in a town. 
there's a sense in which Mark does a very subversive thing. He, he borrows or perhaps he steals, but in any case, he repurposes a word of Roman empire and of Roman oppression, and he repurposes it to suit the function of Jesus' ministry. And where Rome used the word eongelion, the good news of Rome, to bring this message of conquest or triumph, military and economic conquest and triumph, Mark takes the word and he turns it on his head and he says, but this is the real good news. Forget about what Rome meant with the word. The real good news is that of Christ proclaiming uh, healing for the sick and liberation for the imprisoned and life and life in abundance for the poor and for the sinful. So right off the bat, Mark does an interesting thing. He takes this, this term and he wants to make it uh, 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 he wants to tell a different story with it. And we see what he means by that different story as we move through the text. Now, John the Baptist, who of course was active prophet living out in the desert, uh, is put in prison by Herod Antipas. And all we know is that Jesus was in the desert for 40 days. And so somewhere between Jesus coming out of the desert and John being imprisoned, the following thing happens. Jesus goes into Galilee proclaiming the good news the eongelion of God, not of Caesar, of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. What a short sermon to start your ministry on. And yet it contains and it says so much. That first word, the time has come. There, there are two words in the Greek language that, that, that are used when talking about time. The one we know very well. The one is chronos. And that's the time you look at on your watch. That's the, that's the linear, or shall we call it the chronological walking of time. The kind we use to get through our day, to meet appointments, to meet deadlines. That's the one word, chronos. That's not the word that, Mark, that, that Jesus uses. The word used here is kairos, and that is better translated, not necessarily with time, but with the spirit of the time. The Germans have a word they call zeitgeist, which is specifically that, that, that feeling of time that you're in, not necessarily the hour and the day that you've arrived at. Jesus begins his ministry not by saying, it's nine o'clock on a Sunday, but by saying, the spirit of the time has arrived. Something has changed. This time, when I start speaking, is different for a whole host of reasons than all the times that have come before and all the times that will come after. It's as if he is saying, it's time. Or perhaps he's saying, time's up. This Kairos time has now come into fulfillment. And that comes with a new set of commandments. Because the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Now again, kingdom is one way to translate the word that Jesus uses here, but a better word might be the reign of God. Again, a kingdom is something that is fixed to a time and a place, quite like the Roman Empire was fixed to a time and a place. But the word used here, Basileia, doesn't refer to a fixed time and place kingdom. It refers to dominion. It refers to the reign of someone over an empire or over a people. And in this sense, what Jesus is saying is the kingdom of God is not a place or a time. The kingdom of God is his reign being announced and being achieved and being accomplished in this kairos, in the spirit of the time. And that in itself is on the one hand a very liberating message for people who hear it, who truly believe. And on the other hand, of course, in keeping with Mark's whole story, a very subversive message against the Roman Empire, against the Roman understanding of time and place and kingdom and power and oppression and subjugation. And that's why it's the first thing Jesus says in this gospel. The time has come. Time's up. Not, not, not this time. 
But the spirit of the time has come for God's good news to become manifest in the world. And that's only the first part of what he says. The second part is just as well known. Repent and believe the good news. And repentance and belief are two sides of the same coin. The next thing Jesus does is he walks along the Sea of Galilee and he finds there working class men, blue collar Joes, fishermen, working, working with their hired hands, working with their family members. Galilee wasn't a big region, still isn't a big region. There's every reason to believe that the people who lived there, who lived in that region, all knew each other or knew each other's families. And in a certain sense, of course, they would have known who Jesus was. I think for me personally, this was one of the big turning mo moments in my, own, in my own life of faith is when I realized that Jesus didn't drop out of the sky one day in Galilee. The people he's talking to probably had some idea who he was. Again, if we read the Gospel of, J of John, the people are asking, this guy who says he's the Messiah, isn't he just Joseph the carpenter's son from Nazareth? These people knew each other. These people knew each other's families and their stories, and in some cases, probably their scandals. And that's what makes the story so much more profound and remarkable, is that they would have known of Jesus, the rabbi, the teacher, but this day, when he's walking along, when they see him coming, let's imagine that he had done it many times before, something was different. Something in what he said was different. Something in the spirit of the time he was saying it in had fundamentally changed. Time had changed. The reign of God had come very near. And it was time to change the way you live by repenting and believing. And so he says to the first two guys he finds, Peter and his brother, follow me and I will make you fishes of men. I will make you fish for men. And without any explanation, they drop everything and they follow him. And Jesus walks on and a while, a while f further along, he finds the next two, Andrew and John. And he says to them, follow me. They're with their father. They're fishing. This is their livelihood. And they leave everything and they follow him. The first disciples were ordinary people, like you, like me. They weren't particularly uh, rich or educated, and they weren't particularly bad or sinful or uh, uneducated. They were simply working class people who earned an honest living within their world, within their means, every day of their lives. They were ordinary people. But of course, what we know is that while they may have been ordinary people, it was an extraordinary time that Christ was calling them into. It was a radical time. Even the image Jesus uses to talk to Peter is the image of fishing for people the way one casts a net to fish in the Sea of Galilee. You are fishing, you are catching these creatures in your net and you are taking them out of the water. And of course, you know what happens to fish when they are taken out of water. After a while, they suffocate. And I wonder if it isn't worth exploring the, the power of that image and what Jesus meant by using that image when we think about the life of faith and the life of discipleship as catching people in our nets out of the waters of the world so that they may do what? So that they may die unto themselves on the dry land of God's grace. But we certainly don't have time in this sermon to explore that thought and get through the story of Jesus calling his disciples, but we certainly have to, have to hold on to that idea, especially because Jesus uses the same, the same basic idea so many times in the Gospels. If you want to follow me, you must die unto yourself. You must, in a sense, Betray yourself. Someone cannot love his own life and be a disciple. And so this idea of being taken out of your comfort zone, out of the world 
to become a disciple and being a fisher of men is not so strange after all. And, and, and we need to talk about it in church and in the life of discipleship more and more and more. The men were ordinary. The times were extraordinary. Jesus is talking to them, and what he says is, time's up, things have changed, follow me. And they leave everything and they follow him. Something else that, that for me in my own life of faith uh, mean, uh, was particularly meaningful was the first time I realized that Jesus doesn't give them a rundown of how this is going to go for the first three years. He doesn't sit them down and give them each, each a sheet of paper and say, what's going to happen is from here we're going to this place and we're going to do that healing. Then we're going to go to that synagogue to preach and then get chased out of that town. And then at the end, we'll get to Jerusalem where I'll be crucified. But don't worry, I will also be resurrected and ascend to heaven. They don't get any of the details. They don't get any of the things that you would think uh, they should know before they start blindly following someone. Part of the reason is because Christ's grace is not predicated upon our knowledge or upon our willingness or upon our capacity and ability to understand what God is doing, how God's kingdom operates in the world. We can flip this whole issue on its head and say Jesus doesn't ask to see their resumes before he calls them. He doesn't give them a, a clever quiz or a clever set of riddles to solve before they can become his disciples. He doesn't even ask them whether they know the basics of the Old Testament, of Torah, of the, of the Hebrew law. Something that you would expect the disciples of a rabbi to at least know. He simply says, follow me. Again, ordinary people called because of an extraordinary time. Ordinary people called to become the citizens of an extraordinary kingdom, reign of God. That's the liberating part of the story. Is that there's nothing that the first disciples, or indeed any of us, have or can do or have done to earn our place in God's kingdom. Or in fact, to earn our place as disciples following him. And there's no knowledge that we need to have of the future. There's nothing that we need to know that will happen in years or months or weeks from now that qualifies us or disqualifies us from truly being a disciple. We often preach this passage and we often think, we often focus on the who. We want to know exactly how many fish uh, the brothers would have caught or what kind of fish they would have caught. We want to know exactly how they lived, what their houses looked like, whether they would have been married, how many kids they would have had. And we can spend a lot of time talking about, about the who, as in who the disciples were. But we need to spend time talking about the when, the kairos, the moment, the spirit of the time in which they were called. And depending on where you are in the world today on January 24th, 2021, and depending on what is happening in your world, whether that be uh, on a national political scale, as might be the case in America, and in fact, in Australia, with Australia Day, which, which brings up so many different emotions for so many different people in this land. Whether you might be in a different place, in a country that is ravaged by COVID-19, whether you might, on a, on a smaller, more personal scale, be dealing with the effects of poverty, Maybe you're dealing with the effects of conflict in your family. If you're dealing with these things, as, as we all are, 
then talking about who the disciples were only takes us halfway. We need to talk about when they were called and what the significance is of God, of Jesus saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. What are we going to do to follow when the time is right? And so those are two parts of the puzzle. The final part is although we can talk about who the disciples were, and certainly we must talk about when they were called and what that means, there's one final thing, and that is the, that is the uppercase, who is calling. Because you see, to be a disciple, to be a follower of Christ, is not to follow an idea of Christ. It's not to follow the image of Christ created by the church. It's not to follow any theology or Christology or Christological arguments about who Jesus might have been or what he, what he might have meant by his words. It's to follow the man himself. And perhaps in the time of Epiphany, in which we celebrate the revelation of Christ for who he was, that is the most important point of this whole story. It's that the disciples along the Sea of Galilee didn't hear about him. They heard from him. It's that they didn't follow him because they knew he was a famous rabbi somewhere down in Jerusalem. It's because he walked up to them, looked them in the eye and said, follow me, I have a calling for you. True disciples, the kind of discipleship that changes the church, that gives us a church in which repentance and belief are held in equal stead, follows Christ, not ideas about Christ. Follows Christ, not the cherry-picked verses that we like about Christ. And that we can only accomplish. We can only, I suppose, explore and be surprised by in living, loving relationship with Jesus. Because when you spend three years walking with your rabbi, you get to know him pretty well. Then he becomes more than just words on a page or ideas in someone's blog on the internet. He certainly becomes more than what we've turned him into in popular culture and in politics and to a certain extent in the church at large. He becomes more than just a miracle worker who is there at our, at our behest to, uh, to answer our prayers and solve our problems. He becomes more than just a charity worker in whose name we do good deeds to those around us. He truly becomes what we celebrate in Epiphany the Son of God, the King of Kings, the one who announces and fulfills the reign of God in this time, in this Kairos. So with that in mind, we will listen to a piece of music that will act as our confession of faith to affirm with the church all around the world and all through the ages, what we believe about Jesus, what we believe about the one who started his ministry saying, time's up, the reign of God is here, repent, believe the good news. We will listen to the music and then depart into the world to carry this gospel, this good news, this Evangelion out into the world. Creating one God Almighty Through your Holy Spirit Conceiving Christ the Son Jesus our Savior I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the whole